Welcome to Wrongful Conviction, False Confessions. I'm Laura Nyrider. And I'm Steve Drizzen. So far, we've told you false confession stories that span the United States, from urban Chicago to rural Nebraska. Today, we'll take you across the globe to New Zealand with a story that still hits way too close to home. A 16-year-old boy who confessed to a rape and murder he didn't commit. His wrongful conviction allowed the real offender, a prolific serial rapist, to assault dozens of other women while a teenager languished behind bars. I'm Laura Nyrider, co-host of Wrongful Conviction, False Confessions. COVID-19 has made this a pretty crazy time. Steve and I hope you're all healthy and safe and keeping your spirits up while lying low. We're both okay and doing our best to keep fighting for justice in the age of coronavirus. Thanks to our incredible production team, we're still able to bring you weekly stories of tragedy, hope, and triumph. In a way, these stories seem particularly important to tell right now. In the meantime, let's stay connected. I'm pretty sure that for me, every minute of social distancing has turned into 10 minutes of social media. So find me on Instagram and Twitter at Laura Nyrider, And let me know how you've been doing. From our Wrongful Conviction podcast family to yours, stay healthy and safe. After Making a Murderer came out, season two, Steve and I have had an opportunity to travel around the globe talking to audiences about the problem of false confessions and the need for criminal justice reform. We've spoken everywhere, you know, from the United States to the United Kingdom to Ireland to Australia. You remember this guy, Steve, who traveled around Australia with us? Oh God, this guy was <laughs> this guy was beautiful. What, what was his name? Simon. Again? His name was Simon. 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 Simon was like a a roadie from the 1970s, always wearing black t-shirts <laughs> and deep into the heavy metal scene. Somehow, poor Simon gets assigned to the lawyers who are traveling around talking about false confessions. One of my personal points of pride, though, is that by the end of this trip around Australia, he seemed to like what we were trying to do. So we had a great time with him. But Simon kept asking us, as did everybody else we met around Australia, have you heard about Tainapora? Have you heard about New Zealand's Brendan Dassey? And that's exactly who Taina is. Police officers around the world are often trained in very similar ways about how to interrogate suspects. And so I expected and was beginning to discover false confessions in places like Japan and Korea and other Commonwealth countries like Australia and New Zealand and Canada. These are stories that hit home around the globe, whether it's for, you know, social justice-driven lawyers or heavy metal roadies. You know, Tana Pora, Brendan Dassey, we all know someone vulnerable like them. And we can all see the need to do justice in cases like these. Tana Pora's story starts about 8,000 miles away from where Steve and I are sitting right now in the United States. It starts in South Auckland. That's an urban area on the southern edge of New Zealand's largest city, Auckland. It's home to a large minority population, including Maoris, the indigenous Polynesian population of New Zealand. Parts of South Auckland can have negative connotations. Too often, it's associated with poverty and crime. When our story starts in 1992, South Auckland was home to a 39-year-old woman named Susan Burdett. Susan lived alone in a tidy house on Pa Road. She worked days as an accounts clerk at a chemical manufacturing company. And on the evening of March 23, 1992, Susan leaves her weekly bowling league meetup and drives home under a night of beautiful stars. Susan's a hard worker, so when she doesn't show up at work the next few days, her colleagues get concerned. They call her friend Steve eventually to find out if he knows where she is. Steve gets worried, and he ends up going over to Susan's house that Wednesday, March 25th, at about 12.40 p.m. He finds the front door unlocked, goes inside, and is greeted with a horrible sight. Susan is lying horizontally on her waterbed, and she's clearly dead. The upper half of her body is wrapped in a duvet, and there's a wooden baseball bat lying on the bed next to her. Her legs are dangling off the side of the bed, and they're crossed. Someone, whoever did this, had positioned her that way. 
The police arrive, they remove the duvet, and they find that Susan had been beaten badly about the head, very likely with a baseball bat. She'd also been sexually assaulted, and there's plenty of DNA left behind. Semen, as well as a bloody smudge mark on a light switch. Susan's hands were covered with defensive wounds, which indicates that she'd fought back against her attacker. And her friends later identified the baseball bat as belonging to Susan. She had kept it next to her bed for her own protection. The police begin by investigating Susan's other friends, but DNA and alibis clear them all, and the investigation quickly stalls. The pressure is building. Building, that is, until about a week after the murder. That's when police get a call from a woman named Terry McLaughlin, and she tells them a story about her then 16-year-old nephew, a shaggy-haired, baby-faced Maori kid named Tana Pora. Well, let's talk about Tana for a bit. Tana had it rough growing up. His mother died when he was a young boy, and his father left shortly afterwards. He then got passed around from family member to family member, and ultimately ended up in his Aunt Terry's house. A few days after Susan Burdett's murder made headlines, Tana and some friends found a baseball bat in the local park, and they were joking about it being the murder weapon. Back at Aunt Terry's house, Tana kept talking about the bat— Tana had a history of run-ins with the law. Nothing really serious, but enough for Terry to want him out of her house. She called the police over and over, insisting that Tana knew something about Susan Burdett's murder. But police quickly come to the conclusion that Tana and his buddies were just overexcited teens who were talking shit. They interview Tana, they take his DNA, they even execute a search warrant— But Tana and his friends are ruled out conclusively as Susan Burdett's killers. The DNA doesn't match. The search warrant turns up nothing. And while Tana does have a record, there is nothing in his background that would suggest this level of violence or depravity. Now let's fast forward almost exactly 12 months to March 18, 1993. We're almost a year out now from the discovery of Susan Burdett's body. In the course of police investigations, that's a lifetime. And this is the only unsolved homicide from 1992. Tana Pora is 17 years old now. He still has that baby face, but his police record has grown. During a routine interview with Tana about a car theft, police get an anonymous phone tip about Susan Burdett's murder. This caller links the murder to a local gang called the Mongrel Mob, a gang Tana is rumored to have connections with. So the police decide to keep him at the station for questioning. His interrogation begins at 9 a.m. and continues for the next four days. The police have Tana Pora in the interrogation room. And he's telling multiple different stories. The stories don't make any sense. And it's not an interrogation with banging of the table or raised voices or threats or even promises. Take your time. You made a comment that you were going to tell us more. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, well, tell us. This is a 17-year-old kid who is highly suggestible and eager to please the authorities. They're plying him with cigarettes and fast food and drinks. You had uh, spring roll, hot dog, chips, and a drink. Is that correct? The detectives even mention $20,000 as a reward for information about Susan Burdett's rape and murder. Tana's story keeps evolving, and the camera keeps getting turned on and off. You said you were going to tell us everything. First, Tana tells the police that he drove two other men to Susan's house and waited outside while they went in to attack her. You were telling us about a person called Dog raping this woman. Did you hear any more or see any more? No, I was outside in the car waiting. Eventually, he changes that story. I follow what you've said so far, that you've climbed in the bedroom window and you've gone through to open the door up for the other two. All right? Now he's climbing in through one of Susan Burdett's windows and letting the other two in through the front door. So when you were in there, you could see quite clearly what was happening. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. And I was just watching. And you were just watching, okay. And in the end, after four days, Tana confesses to being in the room, to actually holding Susan down while his two associates raped her. And you were in the room some of this time while this was happening, is that right? You were holding Susan down, is that right? 
And that last story, Mm -hmm. the one that ultimately seals Tana's fate, it comes after a break in the tea room where, of course, the cameras are turned off. At the suggestion of the police, Tana identifies these two supposed accomplices as senior members of the mongrel mob, that local gang. The police bring in those two individuals that Tana had named, but their DNA doesn't match the DNA found on Susan's body. They're cleared, and they're released. Things don't go as smoothly for Tana. He's arrested based on his confession. He's charged with Susan Burdett's rape and murder. And 14 long months later, prosecutors try Tana Pora for participating in the murder of Susan Burdett, along with two unknown accomplices. Now let's stop right here for a minute. This is round one of the battle of these two titans of evidence. Confessions versus DNA. DNA seemed to clear Tana Pora of any role in this crime, but it's the confessions that ultimately lead to his conviction. On June 16, 1994, a jury took less than 90 minutes to convict Tana Pora of rape and murder. He received a life sentence and was shipped off to prison. At the same time, the New Zealand police are beginning a focused investigation into six rapes that had occurred between 1988 and 1992 in the Auckland area, including Susan Burdett's rape. Now, these attacks were all similar enough that some police officers began to worry that they had a serial rapist on their hands. All of them involved a lone wolf attacker who broke into women's homes, wrapped their heads in blankets or duvets, and repositioned them so that they lay sideways across the edge of the bed during the attack. And by April 1996, a few years after Tana's conviction, the investigation into these rapes linked them all, including Susan Burdett's attack, to the DNA of the same person, a man named Malcolm Rewa. Now, who is Malcolm Rewa? First of all, he's 20 years older than Tana Pura. And while I usually try to avoid characterizing my fellow humans like this, Rewa is a monster. He's a terrifying figure, a prolific serial rapist. He's the kind of predator that women worry about. He's their worst nightmare. Rewa committed his first rape in the 1970s. His wife was in labor giving birth to their child at the time, so Rewa took the opportunity to sexually assault a nurse in a hospital bed. Unbelievable. Four and a half years in prison he spent for that awful crime. So Rewa gets out of prison and apparently rapes again. From then on, over the dozens of rapes that he went on to commit, Rewa started developing a pattern, an M.O., He'd carefully select his victims, who tended to be single women professionals who were home alone. He'd stake out their homes in advance and plan his attacks meticulously. And then, always the same thing. A surprise attack after the woman had fallen asleep, a physical attack first to subdue her, then the blanket or duvet around her head, and a rape at the side of the bed. And Rewa would hide in their homes. He would wait for them to get into bed and begin to fall asleep. And then he would attack. Rewa apparently suffered from erectile dysfunction, which is why he positioned his victims in a way that allowed him to maintain sexual contact during his attacks. That's also why he acted alone. He didn't exactly want an audience. Ray was arrested on May 13, 1996. It's a pretty dramatic sting operation, actually. The police had been planning this for quite some time. When he tries to run, police dogs wrestle this guy to the ground. Now, the police remember that Tana Pora had already confessed to one of the rapes to which Rewa is tied by DNA. So they immediately ask him if he knows Tana Pora. Rewa is crystal clear. Never met him. Based on the arrest of Malcolm Rewa, the Court of Appeals throws out Tana's conviction in 1999. Never met him. Now, at this point in time, where you have a prolific serial rapist operating in the same neighborhood as the Burdett murder, and his DNA is at the crime scene, and he's telling you, I don't know Tana Pora, most prosecutors and police officers would throw their hands up and say, we can't go forward with a re-prosecution of Tana Pora. We have to free him. 
but instead, Tana is retried. And if you've listened to this podcast, you know what's coming. Prosecutors change their theory of the case and argue at Tana's second trial that he and Rewa raped and killed Susan Burdett together. Even though Rewa had denied knowing Tana, even though Rewa always acted alone, and even though Rewa would never have wanted some teenager there to witness his sexual dysfunction. So now we have round two of a battle between confession evidence and DNA evidence, except this time we know whose DNA it is. It's the DNA of a serial rapist named Malcolm Rewa. Will Tana's confession bring him down, or will the jury side with the science and recognize that Tana Pora and Malcolm Rewa had never met? Sure enough, despite all hopes that the DNA evidence would be enough to clear Tana, Tana was convicted a second time of raping and murdering Susan Burdett and sent back to his life sentence. Meanwhile, Malcolm Rewa himself stood trial for three months in 1998 on what amounted to 45 counts of rape involving 27 different women. His trial ended with convictions for sexually assaulting 25 of them, including Susan Burdett. Just like Tana, he was shipped off to prison for decades. Now, this is justice for Rewa, but for Tana Pora, it's anything but. And for years, Tana served his time with little hope of freedom, and things might have stayed bleak for him had it not been for a man named Tim McKinnell. Now, who is Tim McKinnell? At the moment, I'm a self-employed private investigator, uh, but when I finished university, I joined the police as a 22-year-old. Tim McKinnell started out his career as a cop, a good cop, one of the best cops. Tim had become a member of the South Auckland Police Force in the late 1990s, eventually rising to junior detective by the year 2000. That year, the force had been divided over the case of Tana Pora. A lot of chat went on in, in the police bar at the time, and there was a real disconnect between two different groups of people, people that thought Tana Porter was a guilty man and had been involved in the rape and murder of Susan Burdett. And there was another camp of experienced police officers who thought that he was an innocent man. In fact, Tim remembers seeing all manner of drunken arguments at police bars, and he was struck by the passion of those who believed in Tana Pora. Tim never forgot those arguments or his own growing doubt about Tana's guilt, even after he eventually left the police force and, as many retired officers do, he became a private investigator. Now, in 2007, Tim attended a local conference on wrongful convictions and false confessions. And that conference brought up those old lingering questions that Tim had about Tana's case. The last straw came when Tim was diagnosed in his 30s with a rare blood disorder. Not exactly a death sentence, but the kind of health scare that led him to reevaluate his priorities and seek out more meaningful work, like freeing the innocent. Eventually, Tim decided to take the plunge. In 2009, he visited Tana Pora, who was then 34 years old, in prison. Tana was no longer that teenage car thief Tim had read about. He was polite, well-mannered, surprisingly gentle, even warm, Tim begins to feel an urge to help this guy. But there's the matter of Tana's confession. Tim starts by digging up videotapes of Tana's interrogation, and they're not easy to find. They're on old VHS tapes in boxes in police departments, but he gets them, and he sits down to watch them, and he is blown away by what he saw. When you examine what he was able to say on day one in the first few interviews on tape and you compare that to what he was able to say four days later, there are marked differences. There were some very particular things that happened in Susan's house that the offender would know and it's clear from the interviews that Tana Porter had no idea about any of them. Despite four days' worth of trying, Tana just was not able to tell a story that matched what actually happened. When police asked him to describe Susan Burdett, he says she was chubby, even though she was actually quite athletic. Tana is asked to draw a picture of how he left Susan's body. Remember, she'd been found horizontally with her legs dangling over the side of the bed. But he draws her lying vertically on the bed. 
When he was asked whether there was anything special about Susan's bed, Tana can't come up with the fact that it was a waterbed. And so one of the questions that arises about that is how did he come to know things on day four that he didn't know on day one? The interrogators take Tana on a field trip to Susan Burdett's street so that he can point out details of the crime to them in person. And they videotape the whole thing. He started giving them directions that were taking them away from her house. Uh, So they helpfully tried to direct him back towards her house. Uh, It was pretty clear on tape that he still had no idea where he was going and uh, wasn't able to identify anything familiar. In the end, they took him to the outside of the house where Susan had been raped and murdered and asked him if he recognised anything. And again, he didn't. So the police officer, and it's really chilling really chilling to to watch it. He said, look, it's clear you don't recognise what it is you're looking for, so do you think it would help if I showed you a house? And that's an extraordinary thing for a police officer to do. For Tim, that's it. This was a false confession. He was motivated, fired up, and he would not rest until Tainapura was cleared. But he needs to present more evidence to the lawyers and other people he wants to get involved in this case. So Tainer's case isn't one that was only scarred by a false confession. There were the other issues that were beginning to arise with the involvement of Tainer's family. Tainer's cousin became a key witness for the prosecution against Tainer. She claimed that she had seen Tainer with Rewa on multiple occasions, including once at Tana's girlfriend's home. But Tim was able to discredit Martha's testimony. There was evidence of paid witnesses, including his uh, cousin and his auntie. Those family members gave evidence against him, and we know that at least one of them was paid $5,000 for her trouble. Tim tracks down Fiona, Tana's girlfriend, and Fiona says that she has no idea who Malcolm Rewa was and that he was never in her home. From his time on the police force, Tim was well acquainted with the various gangs operating around South Auckland. So for him, one piece of the prosecution's argument was clearly ridiculous. Malcolm Rewa was a senior member of the Highway 61 Motorcycle Club, mortal enemies of the mongrel mob. And so Tana Porter, uh, somebody who was supposedly involved with the mongrel mob, uh, going to Susan Burdett's house late one night uh, with a senior member of the Highway 61s to commit a brutal rape and murder. Uh, Anybody that knows anything about gang culture in New Zealand will tell you that that's just nonsense. Tim doesn't stop there. He also starts assembling an all-star team of experts, starting with an Icelandic professor and former detective himself, Giesli Goodjohnson, who was a professor by that time in London. Now, Giesli essentially created the field of false confession science. He's the father of everything we're talking about during this podcast. And after Tim sends him Tana's interrogation videos, Giesli agrees to write a report deconstructing Tana's statements and deeming them unreliable. Next, Tim enlists the help of a respected local New Zealand journalist named Phil Taylor. Phil had questioned the state's case against Tainer for years and is happy to help. And Phil delivers. In 2012, as the case for Tainer's innocence is building, Phil releases a bombshell article titled Innocent Man in Jail for 20 Years. And in it, Chuck Henwood, the detective who had developed the original criminal profile of Malcolm Rewa, says the cops got it horribly wrong in Susan Burdett's case. Tana had nothing to do with this. Now, this is a huge deal because Chuck Henwood is the most famous criminal profiler in New Zealand, a bit like John Douglas of the Mindhunter fame. For somebody like Chuck Henwood to come out and express a firmly held conviction that Tana Porter was innocent, was hugely important in terms of public perception and momentum for our appeal work on Tainer's case. And in the middle of this, there's this remarkable moment when Susan Burdett's brother, Jim, comes forward and says, I too believe that Tainer Pora is innocent. And he actually meets with Tainer Pora. It's this incredible moment of reconciliation and grace. Momentum is building across the board, but there's still one more piece. 
Can Tim provide a better understanding, a better explanation of why Tana confessed to a crime he didn't commit? We had a documentary maker called Michael Bennett making a documentary about Tana's case. Perhaps the most significant development in 20 years occurred because the person that had been watching it was a woman called Dr. Valerie McGinn. Dr. McGinn provides Tim with the answer he needs. She writes a report saying your client, Mr. Tana Pora, sounds very similar to many people with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. She even attaches a journal article that details how individuals with FASD are at an increased risk of getting arrested and, more importantly, People that have it can be impulsive, they're suggestible, uh, they're eager to please figures of authority. And so when you look at those types of behaviours and then you consider the, the position Tainer was in when he was in the police station in 1993, uh, it almost makes it inevitable that he was going to confess to something Dr. McGinn confirms categorically that Tana suffers from an FASD disorder. He was uniquely susceptible to falsely confessing in the interrogation room. One of the things that really bothered me about Tana's case is we could never understand why he did what he did. The things he said and the people he implicated, it just none of it made sense to us and we couldn't explain that to the courts. And so once we got this diagnosis of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, it all became clear. It was the final piece of the puzzle and we finally understood what it was we were dealing with. And that does it. All the pieces are assembled for Tim and his team to appeal Tana's conviction. And they bring the case in November of 2014 to the Privy Council in London, the final court of appeal where Commonwealth countries like New Zealand can bring cases like Tana's. It's the court of last resort, and it's staffed with senior judges, some of the best and brightest minds in the entire Commonwealth. Now, this is Tana's last shot, and his lawyers put his FASD disorder at the front of their case, arguing that judges in the 1994 and 2000 trials weren't aware of his disability, and if they had been, they would have ruled differently. There was a big group of people that gathered at Michael Bennett, the documentary maker's house, uh, waiting for that decision to be announced, and it was an extraordinary moment. We only got to tell Tana about an hour before the whole world found out that he had his conviction quashed and he was no longer a rapist and murderer. It was incredibly emotional for him. On March 3rd, 2015, in the case of Pora versus the Queen, the council rules that Tana's confessions must be thrown out and they quash his conviction for the rape and murder of Susan Burdett. Two weeks later, the Crown prosecutors drop their case and decline to retry Tana. And after more than 20 years, Tana Pora was officially exonerated. You know what his first concern was for? It was for the police officers that had interviewed him. He didn't want their reputations to be tarnished because of what had happened. One of his first thoughts was for other people, and that was, that was pretty cool. In so many of these wrongful conviction cases, you see people go through so much pain, and they have every right to be bitter, resentful, angry, all of those things. But so often you see them express, at least publicly, these incredible acts of grace. It's almost as though they've lived through so much pain, they don't want to cause any more. In 2016, Tana received a sum of money to compensate him for the time he had spent in prison for a crime he did not commit. He also received an apology from the New Zealand government. Tana grew up in prison. He was there for 22 years. And he struggles every day. Um, we keep in contact, but... Life isn't great for him. The money makes some things easier, uh, but it doesn't repair the psychological damage. It doesn't bring the years back, and it doesn't make his life easy now. It is incredibly difficult to watch uh, him struggle through life after everything he's been through. Tana, we salute your sheer endurance, your will to keep on fighting and surviving and living through this ordeal. From the other side of the planet, know that we won't forget your name or what you've been through. And all of us together, we're fighting to make sure it doesn't happen again. And that's the story of Tana Pora. Next week's episode takes us to El Paso, Texas, where a total stranger became invested in the case of Daniel Villegas and turned out to be his savior. Till then, thanks for listening.
Wrongful Conviction, False Confessions is a production of Lava for Good Podcasts in association with Signal Company No. 1 and PRX. Special thanks to our executive producer, Jason Flom, and the team at Signal Company No. 1, executive producer Kevin Wardus, senior producer Ann Pope, and additional production and editing by Connor Hall. Our music was composed by Jay Ralph. You can follow me on Instagram or Twitter at Laura Nyrider. And you can follow me on Twitter at S. Drizzen. For more information on the show, visit wrongfulconvictionpodcast.com. And be sure to follow the show on Instagram at Wrongful Conviction, on Facebook at Wrongful Conviction Podcast, and on Twitter at Wrong Conviction. I'm Laura Nyrider, co-host of Wrongful Conviction, False Confessions. COVID-19 has made this a pretty crazy time. Steve and I hope you're all healthy and safe and keeping your spirits up while lying low. We're both okay and doing our best to keep fighting for justice in the age of coronavirus. Thanks to our incredible production team, we're still able to bring you weekly stories of tragedy, hope, and triumph. In a way, these stories seem particularly important to tell right now. In the meantime, let's stay connected. I'm pretty sure that for me, every minute of social distancing has turned into 10 minutes of social media. So find me on Instagram and Twitter at Laura Nyrider, and let me know how you've been doing. From our Wrongful Conviction podcast family to yours, stay healthy and safe.